Today we're going to be looking at a condition known as Kahn syndrome, where there's too much aldosterone in the blood. A good way of starting with Kahn syndrome is by first of all reviewing the structure and functions of the adrenal glands. So if you remember, we have our adrenal glands which sit on top of our kidneys, and we can look at the adrenal glands in more detail, visualizing the different layers involved. The topmost layer is known as the zona glomerulosa, which secretes mineralocorticoids like aldosterone. The second layer we have is the zona fasciculata, which secretes glucocorticoids like cortisol. And then the third layer down is the zona reticularis, which secretes androgens. These three layers can be coupled together to form the adrenal cortex. And then we finally have the adrenal medulla, which secretes the catecholamines like adrenaline. For the purposes of this video, we're mainly going to be focusing on the topmost layer, the zona glomerulosa, as this is the layer which secretes aldosterone, and aldosterone is the main hormone affected in Kahn syndrome. So now that we understand that aldosterone is secreted from the adrenal glands, we can move on to understanding how exactly aldosterone is secreted within the system, and more specifically the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, or the RAS system. So we start off with angiotensinogen, which is a substance secreted by the liver, and this is converted to angiotensin 1 via an enzyme called renin. And this renin enzyme is produced in the kidneys. The next step involves angiotensin 1 being converted to angiotensin 2 via an enzyme called ACE, or angiotensin converting enzyme. And this ACE is produced by the lungs, as you can see from the diagram here. And then angiotensin 2 has multiple effects, but two of the main effects are vasoconstriction, so basically um, causing constriction of blood vessels to increase the blood pressure. And we also have the effect of triggering aldosterone production in the adrenal glands. Okay, so let's imagine a situation where the renin angiotensin aldosterone system has been activated and we have angiotensin 2, which is triggering aldosterone release. Well, what exactly is the effect of aldosterone? The way I like to think about it is that there are three main effects aldosterone has, and it tends to happen between the blood and the renal ducts where aldosterone tends to act. So the first effect is that aldosterone helps to increase sodium reabsorption. So more sodium is reabsorbed from the renal duct into the blood. The second effect is increased water reabsorption. And the reason for this is that water tends to follow sodium down a concentration gradient. And as a result, we get more H2O reabsorption in this case. And then the third effect is potassium excretion. So more potassium moving from the blood into the renal duct to be excreted into the urine. And the main effect of all of these is to basically regulate blood pressure. And combining this with the vasoconstriction effect, this helps to keep blood pressure within a normal range. So now that we have an understanding of how aldosterone works, we can turn towards the condition in question, which is Kahn syndrome. So we can break down the term Kahn syndrome or primary hyperaldosteronism. Uh, where primary means that there's a problem with the target organ, so in other words, a problem with the adrenal glands, and hyperaldosteronism simply means that there's too much aldosterone in the blood. So there are two main causes of Kahn syndrome, the first being unilateral adrenal adenomas, and the second being bilateral adrenal hyperplasia. So just starting with the adenomas, what happens is we can have a benign growth of the adrenal glands, and more specifically, there's a growth of the zona glomerulosa, uh, which if you remember is the layer which secretes aldosterone. Um, and as a result of this overgrowth, uh, these tumor cells begin to secrete more aldosterone into the blood um, than is normal, and as a result, patients develop symptoms and signs of Kahn syndrome. Um, so just to summarize that, uh, one of the adrenal glands is generally affected um, in a unilateral adrenal adenoma. Moving on to bilateral adrenal hyperplasia, uh, what happens here is that we have um, basically enlargement of the cells of both adrenal glands, and this results in more aldosterone being secreted by these enlarged cells. Um, so just comparing the two conditions, uh, you can see that the zona glomerulosa is affected in only one of the adrenal glands in a unilateral adrenal adenoma, whereas the zona glomerulosa layers of both adrenal glands become enlarged in bilateral adrenal hyperplasia. And it's important to make this distinction because the management will depend on which condition the patient has.
moving towards the signs and symptoms of Kohn syndrome, the way I like to think about it is by remembering the normal functions of aldosterone and extrapolating to see what would happen if there's too much aldosterone in the blood. So for example, one of the main functions of aldosterone is to increase sodium reabsorption. So if there's too much aldosterone, we can get hypernatremia or excess sodium in the blood. Likewise, if there's too much H2O reabsorption, we can get hypertension or hypervolemia. And if there's too much potassium excretion, we can get hypokalemia, so less potassium in the blood. And these electrolyte changes or blood pressure changes can basically help to determine which symptoms of Kohn syndrome the patient will experience. So what exactly do I mean by that? Well, we can basically look at each of these changes which happen because of too much aldosterone and work out the symptoms based on these. So for example, with hypernatremia, um, if there's too much sodium, patients might feel more thirsty than normal. They might go to the toilet more often um, and they might also experience some fatigue or weakness symptoms as a result of this hypernatremia. With hypertension, patients may experience headaches, although this probably happens at higher uncontrolled levels of blood pressure. And with hypokalemia, patients may complain of muscle cramps or heart palpitations. And for the latter, it's important to treat this quickly as they might be a risk of cardiac arrhythmia. In terms of diagnosis of Kohn syndrome, the mainstay involves measuring the plasma renin to plasma aldosterone ratio. And the way this works is that we can look at the renin and aldosterone levels and compare them to work out the most likely diagnosis. So for instance, if renin is reduced but aldosterone is increased, well here we can tell that there's a problem directly with the adrenal glands since only aldosterone is affected. So the most likely diagnosis here would be a primary Kohn syndrome. If, on the other hand, both renin and aldosterone are increased, well here we can tell that there's a problem further up the RAS system, or a secondary hyperaldosteronism at play. And causes behind this might be heart failure, renal artery stenosis, or other conditions. It's also important to do other investigations for suspected Kohn syndrome, such as electrolytes and blood pressure measurement. And the main thing you're looking for here is the triad of hypernatremia, hypokalemia, and hypertension. Adrenal venous sampling might also be considered, and this is basically a process by which you measure the hormones coming from each adrenal gland to work out whether there's a problem unilaterally or bilaterally. It might also be worth doing some imaging, so CT scans or MRIs, to work out whether there's an adenoma present or if it's bilateral hyperplasia. And just as one example, you can see from the scan that there's a, an adrenal adenoma present on the right side. In terms of the treatment options for Kwan syndrome, the management depends on the underlying condition. So in the case of a unilateral adrenal adenoma, the definitive management is to laparoscopically remove the diseased region, which helps to resolve the symptoms. In the case of a bilateral adrenal hyperplasia, in this case, you can't remove both adrenal glands, so you would have to manage this more conservatively, focusing on aldosterone antagonists such as spironolactone or pleuronone, and also combining this with a low sodium diet to help to reduce the symptoms for the patient. Okay, so just to finish off, we have a short clinical case. A 48 year old male presents with increased thirst, frequent urination, headaches, and muscle cramps. His blood results show raised aldosterone levels, but normal renin levels. What do you expect to see for his electrolytes and blood pressure? So in this case, you can see that the patient's presenting with classical signs and symptoms of Kohn syndrome. And if you remember, the triad in Kohn syndrome is hypernatremia, hypokalemia, and hypertension. And as a follow-up question, on CT and MRI imaging, no tumors can be found on either of the adrenal glands. What is the most likely diagnosis and the best treatment regime for this patient? So because you can't find any tumors in particular for the glands, it means that there might be an adrenal hyperplasia instead, which is a bit harder to pick up on a scan alone. So combining this part of the question with the raised aldosterone levels, you would be more concerned about a bilateral adrenal hyperplasia. And as I mentioned in the previous slide, the best treatment regime for this would be an aldosterone antagonist such as spironolactone and combining this with a low sodium diet. And here we just have a quick summary slide explaining everything we've gone through in this video. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments below and I'll see you in the next video.